Right, now, we have a fantastic session coming up. The uh, Predict and Prevent Insure Tech Pitches. This is always a, a fantastic and exciting uh, option. And one of my old colleagues is here as well, so I'm looking forward to his pitch in particular. But George, can we uh, get you started on this wonderful session? Thank you. All right, we're good. Thank you, John. I'm excited to be moderating the session uh, on Predict and Prevent. I think it's going to be a very interesting one. I, I kind of feel like the whole of today's seminar was really gearing up for this because everybody has been talking about how ne things need to shift, shift to prediction. Everybody is talking about the technology as an enabler for this. So I think it, it, I'm personally very excited. Uh, I think it's also very interesting because usually you kind of see the, the insure techs coming in to pitch and now we, we twist it around and we have many of the, the insurers also pitching to you today. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll get the, the, uh, my, my session participants to join you on stage and then uh, we'll, we'll kind of uh, I'll finish introducing the session as well. Um, the uh, session is going to be basically predicting predict awards as part of the global innovation uh, awards that are part of uh, uh, presented by the IAS and insurance thought leadership celebrating this transformative uh, technology and the solutions within insurance and risk management. So it's, uh, it, it's a new award. I think this is the first time that uh, we're doing it. So it, it is something that is quite uh, innovative in itself. Uh, there are actually three awards. Uh, there is awards on the uh, uh, property and casualty, uh, life, health, and retirement, and predict and prevent. The winners for the property casualty and life, health, and retirement has already been determined. So the, this one is going to be the only one that you guys get to actually vote for, which is, I think is itself is a pretty exciting thing. So this is where you need to actually participate. We want you to participate and listen. Uh, it, it's not going to be one of those sessions where you kind of sit back and, and you know, the, uh, try to absorb it. I think there's really, really interesting solution that we have uh, from across the industry. So there were a, a lot of submissions. We, uh, the committee have uh, nailed it down to this three uh, finalists for the predict and prevent. Um, and uh, therefore, you are going to be the one that determined the winner. So these guys uh, have pressure to, to really uh, showcase it to us. Um, and this award recognizes insure techs and insurers that have showcased innovative ways to leverage technology, prioritizing resi uh, resiliency and sustainability uh, as well, uh, and really thinking about that uh, impact dimension of their solution because it is not just for themselves, it's for the industry, it's for, for the wider society. So this lens, I think, is a very important one for us to think about as we, as we uh, listen to these presentations. Um, and uh, really about addressing the risk, uh, minimizing the impact, and, and thinking about, again, not just uh, risk as it happens, but risk ahead of us, and how do we think about it, how do we quantify it, how do we prevent it, how do we help uh, the clients in that respect. Um, and would, I would like to thank Global Innovation Awards Committee for helping to determine the three finalists. So we have uh, AIA, we have Risk Care, and we have Swiss Re. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, and in the moment, uh, you will have uh, the three of them pitch you uh, their solutions, and we will announce the winner at the awards dinner later on. So this is like drums roll, um, and we will hear uh, first up, we will hear Abraham Lucas, uh, Director of Vitality, uh, share with us Amplify, uh, about their solution in the Amplify Health. Uh, second, we'll have uh, Gurdiff uh, Jokar, from, uh, he's the Chief Insurance Officer at Generali Malaysia, uh, to share with us about the risk uh, cover. And then the uh, third one is going to be Jonathan Rake, CEO of Asia Pacific from Swiss Re Corporate Solutions, share about the Swiss Re. So, risk care, sorry. Um, and uh, please, so I'll, I'll hand the mic over to you. Uh, we want to hear all about uh, the interesting things that you guys are working on, and take, take the mic. Sure, great. Okay, good afternoon. 
I'd actually like to start with a video. Hey, hey, bagaimana... Nama saya Laila Munaf. Saya adalah salah satu co-founders dari Sana Studio dan juga gold member dari AIA Vitality. Aku diajak kerjasama untuk memperkenalkan AIA Vitality dan it's brilliant. This is like your walking coach, mengencourage orang-orang untuk memulai berolahraga, tapi ada rewardsnya yang membuat semakin semangat. Keluarga saya yang sudah menjalankan hidup sehat, ternyata suami terkena cancer di usia 30 tahun. Jadi, kenapa asuransi itu penting? Karena ya, hal-hal yang di luar kendali kita could happen anytime. Buat aku, sehat dan bahagia itu goes hand in hand. It's not only when you look good that you feel good, but also when you feel good inside, you look good. Thank you. So, the intent of showing that video is part of the intent of what Vitality is meant to help us do, which is we're repositioning ourselves in the industry and the industry itself to be what are the common issues we know with insurance take up and the protection gap. Well, we know that there's a perception that insurance is only for people who are sick or about to become sick. There's also this idea that insurance is not really needed if you're healthy. And part of what we're trying to do with Vitality is to show that actually Insurance should be for everyone, uh, but we admit that there are some changes that the model needs to make in order to become accessible, to become truly for healthy people, if you could put it that way. So I want to start by talking a little bit about why vitality is needed in the first place. We heard this morning about the poly crisis. Well, one of the crises that we're dealing with right now is the onset of non-communicable diseases or, to put it in another way, diseases which are definitely attributable to behavior. And as economic development increases, actually more and more we're seeing that the burden of disease is shifting in this direction. The fact that burden of disease is linked with behavior means that it is, by definition, predictable and then also preventable, assuming you can modify that behavior, and that's where the trick is. Now, why does AIA care? Why would an insurance company take an interest in non-communicable diseases? Isn't that the realm of public health? In 2020, AIA set out to make it as its core purpose helping people in Asia live healthier, longer, better lives. And that has informed so many decisions that we've taken since then. It's meant to reposition us in the minds of the consumers and in the minds of the people who work there to say, we are not going to just sit on the sidelines and hope that people do not get ill and then be shocked and panic when claims go up and when people are getting sick. That's not a smart business strategy, nor does it really fulfill the opportunity that we have to shape better outcomes. So how does this tie to vitality? Vitality is really, you could say at its core, a behavioral uh, psychology or a behavioral economics tool. And one of the key principles that it's dealing with is this idea of hyperbolic discounting, where I think everyone knows and believes that a healthier lifestyle will lead to better outcomes, and yet we still have trouble adhering to it. Why? It's because the value of that healthier lifestyle, while some of it might be felt right away, a lot of it, and especially when we talk about things like diabetes or, or hypertension, well, that's very far away. And so I might tend to deprioritize that or not place a lot of value to that. What vitality does is it brings the value of that healthier lifestyle into the present, and you get the immediate rewards. So how are we doing that? We're focused on three pillars. First is about knowing your health. Then we've got the behavioral improvement, which is improving your health. And quite key, we've got the economic component here, which is your rewards. This is very important. People ask me a lot of times, hey, what is this, a loyalty program for uh, insurance? It doesn't make sense. It is not a loyalty program, even though it does have a lot in common, and we do look at some of the same behaviors. It is actually a form of insurance. Why do I say that? It's because we are actually shaping your risk. 
We are shaping your behavior, therefore we are shaping your risk. Therefore, we can bank those future savings, and a portion of that gets paid to you as the consumer. So this is what we call this shared value insurance concept, of which Vitality is a part. You don't just join Vitality to the side, you get it as part of your underlying insurance pro product, which means that you will get higher benefits, you will get higher cash back, your premium will even go down. And that's really bringing that value right away. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about how this works. In Indonesia in particular, we have a big barrier with going and getting your health checks, your preventative screenings at the time that you should get them. This is not surprising, right? I put it off every year. It's one of the easiest things for me to put off in my calendar. It takes time, I have to pick up the phone, and I have to deal with the fact that I might be reminded that my lifestyle is not as healthy as it could be. And we don't really want to be reminded of that, do we? Well, one of the things we do with Vitality in Indonesia is the first thing is we make that health check free. It's completely free, we pay for it. Secondly, we're going to help you book the appointment. Thirdly, we're going to offer you rewards right away for going and getting that health check and sharing the data with us. Because immediately now, we know so much more about you. And already this is becoming different. We heard earlier about becoming an underwriter of the future. This to me is about what that looks like. You're taking a combination of the health check data plus wearable data plus front page analytics to understand this full pattern of behavior and reward the right behavior. So anyone who's read Atomic Habits by James Clear will know that the moment you adopt a habit, you go from awareness to adoption to adherence, moving into adoption and then doing it twice, already the likelihood that you're building a lifelong habit is increasing every time. So we're really focused on that. You might say, hey, is this Vitality thing a, a, a club for runners or, or a rewards program for people who are really fit? We certainly welcome the fit people, but it's actually more targeted at people who have never gone for a 5K, and we're trying to get you to do your first 5K, because data shows that someone who's successfully completed a 5K is much more likely to adopt a lifelong running habit, and therefore will become cheaper to insure. So it's in our interest to get you to go to that event. I want to talk specifically about rewards, again, the financial component. We have to be compelling, it has to be immediate. You're trying to get people to make changes to their lifestyle that they might not otherwise do. One of the really exciting benefits in Indonesia, we've got this exclusive partnership with Apple, who also has an interest in understanding human behavior and health better. Well, with the Apple Watch, we're actually able to give you not only an upfront discount on that Apple Watch, you're actually able to earn back more than the purchase price in cashbacks if you adhere to a health regimen, your fitness goals you can get 128% of the purchase value of the Apple Watch credited back to you, which means you're getting both the reward the time you buy the watch, and then you're getting that monthly cash back into your mobile wallet. It's direct integration. And we're seeing this as having a really powerful effect. The people who adopt this component of the program are in another league in terms of their adherence to their fitness goals. Not surprising, right? I mentioned the five Ks again, and I think this is becoming less true, but we launched recently in Vietnam and Indonesia was two years ago. Oftentimes when you first show up and you've got the AIA brand, they say, what does AIA have to do with a 5K? And then I have to do my spiel. But it's really cool. I, I think it's so exciting that we can come in, and I want to emphasize here, we're not doing this for charity. We're not doing this to be nice. This is actually in our economic best interest. We figured out a way to reward this behavior in a way that we can measure and we can prove and actually reduce cost of insurance. I'm going to talk specifically really quickly about some of the impact in Indonesia. Uh, we are getting so many of the uh, wearable data. Uh, actually, we've had to influence AIA's cloud strategy because of vitality, which is very exciting to me. I'm very proud of. Uh, we're pulling in data on sleep. We're pulling in data on exercise. We were able to get 540,000 COVID vaccinations incentivized across the group during the pandemic, which means we understood also people's behavior when it came to vaccinations and by country. This data is so valuable for us, but it also shows, because it's all shared with consent, by the way, it shows that people are genuinely starting to participate more and more. I want to show a very important measure here, which is, this is our population who's gone for two health checks. I mentioned before the free health check and how important it is, because that's the verified clinical data. The wearable data is good too, the heart rate's good, and you can get the sleep data more and more, but getting you in, doing the blood panel, Maybe one day we'll have the blood panel on the wrist, but right now we're still doing this. This is really the proof point. And I talked earlier about this being part of our 
core business, these are the numbers that I have to take back to argue for more investment in Vitality. Otherwise, we'd have to discontinue it because we are assuming that we will get results like this. The good news is, and this is from Indonesia specifically, after two years, still early days, but we're seeing the results come in. A couple of other quick impact points I want to talk about. Every metric that we look at, we look closely at how Vitality versus non-Vitality customers perceive us. And not surprisingly, people who join Vitality are much more likely to rate AIA higher on NPS to recommend us. They're also much more likely to rate their advisor. They're also much more likely as to associate us with health and wellness, not surprisingly. And they're also much more likely to stay with us. Persistency was a real issue in Indonesia. And again, we're trying to get people to be in that risk pool. We've already seen an improvement of 6% on vitality versus non-vitality. And I expect that number to go up. Repurchase, again, still early days, but we've seen as high as 50% in some markets increase repurchase rate. Again, not surprising. You're getting more value from this. It's not just buy this policy and then we'll see you next year when your premiums do. You're downloading an app. We're becoming a lifestyle partner. We're trying to be one of those apps that everyone's using every day. We're nudging you. We're trying to reward you. This is a completely different ballgame. So, we're very excited. The app reviews are still strong. We have to keep giving out those rewards to keep the app reviews strong. But we're very happy with the impact so far. OK, I want to say thank you to IIS and PIC for the chance to present today. Just a quick closing thought. Um, certainly, when I turn on the news these days, uh, I get very frustrated. And we heard earlier about some of the crises that are happening. It, it's easy to feel powerless when we see images of suffering and see what's going on around the world. Tools like Vitality are, for me, an illustration of the opportunity our industry has to make this human suffering controllable by be making it firstly predictable and then preventable. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Abraham. So next up, we have Gurdut, Risk Care. Please, go ahead. Okay. Am I audible at the back? I, I was told the mic has some problems. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure to me here, connecting with some of the best minds that are linked to this industry. My name is Gurda Joglekar. I represent Generali at Malaysia. And today, I'd like to talk to you about risk prevention for industrial sites. But before I begin, and I promise not to be super technical or boring, let's, uh, let's look at this. Before I begin, uh, I would like to request all of you to reach out to that glass of water and drink it. Cheers. 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 <laughs> Thank you very much for those of you who did. I was told by the organizers that this water that you just drink or did not drink is chargeable. <laughs> Especially a higher price for the one sitting at the back. OK, um, coming back to my presentation, uh, there's a reason that I, that I bring this analogy for water. And I will connect back on this thought with you towards the end of my presentation. I need you to internalize what just happened in this brief moment. So today I'm going to talk about risk prevention for industrial risk. And as most of you know, that industrial risks are usually challenged by not only severity, but also the frequency of losses that they face. And the most logical solution to control this problem would be prevention. Now, we have a problem here. 
insurers and clients, if I may say, do not have effective tools to handle this situation and have a holistic solution at hand. And this is a real problem. So this is precisely why we think of risk care. And I'll tell you a bit more about it. Uh, risk care partners with our Generali France operations a little over a year and a half back. And um, it had three key goals. First was obviously prevention. Second was to improve the retention. And third, to increase the business penetration. With these three key objectives, we start out this pilot project in France. And I'm very proud to announce we have seen in this very short while four percentage points improvement to the loss ratio. So before I go on any further, I, I do not have the statistics for the other two metrics because it's a little too early to, to measure it. So before I go on with, the, with more about risk care, I'd like you to watch a video. Imagine if we could see what the future holds and change it for the better. Today, many industrial accidents are happening needlessly, but it doesn't have to be this way. Generali is reimagining how we anticipate and react to on-site threats with Risk Care, its new industrial risk management platform, a new paradigm in risk prevention. The first of its kind, this digital AI-based tool introduces a smarter way of working together by integrating data from site visits, guided self-diagnoses, and IoT, we're able to mitigate risks, making industrial sites safer. Underwriters, intermediaries, and industrial site managers can now team up and benefit from the platform's automated monitoring and collaborative approach. Supported by this advanced management system, we can identify risks far quicker and with greater accuracy, even when in-person site visits are not viable and provide timely, tailored solutions. What's more, the system gives access to an ecosystem of trusted providers to implement the suggested measures. Regular, platform-driven checks, complemented by expert analyses and certifications through our partner APAV, ensure recommendations are correctly actioned, avoiding costly risk exposure. Powered by our partner, Comforth Karu, this innovative solution offers the strategic foresight we need to take preventive action. This means fewer accidents and improved business continuity. Our industrial site stakes are high, and present decisions may have ramifications for years. But now, there is a way to make the right choices today for a safer tomorrow. We can't turn back time, so let's change the future instead. This initiative was enabled by the Generali Innovation Fund always on the lookout for bold, innovative and scalable ideas to make our customers' lives easier. Right, so this video essentially is the sense of what I'm going to continue talking for a couple of more minutes. But first, uh, before we go to the tool, I, I want to draw your attention to these two pictures. These are real claim that has happened last year in Generali France that has costed them a huge sum of money. It's a fire claim, as you can see, and the root cause for this claim was battery condenser. Uh, when we start looking at, at this claim more in detail, oh, we, we realize that we had all the information available at the time of writing this risk to have prevented this loss from happening. Unfortunately, our experts made their recommendations to our client, 
but this was all lost in emails and paper reports. Two years hence, we have this claim. This would have been impossible with risk care as a tool in place because risk care has the capability to track all critical recommendations. Next up, I want to talk a few numbers here. So what you see on the top, uh, 60,000 claims, 20 claims per day. These are all French industry stats from the year 2020. One out of 10 sites being visited by insurers. These are French industry numbers, but I'm sure they resonate with all of you because this is the similarity with all the other markets that we are operating in. And so we decide to focus and study our own book, Generally France book, and we studied it for one whole year, the whole portfolio. And after doing that, this is what we got. So if you look to that green part, and before you go to the green part, you, you look at the purple semicircle, that's representing the 100% of your total claims cost. And then you look at, towards your left, uh, you see that green box. That's what we call effective prevention. It means that these were the claims that could have occurred for the company, but were prevented because of the existing prevention practices that the company has, which means it could have been uh, on-site visits, it could have been uh, recommendations, follow-ups, or even uh, cancelling policies or declining writing summaries. All these actions, that preventive actions that currently an organization is taking, that was representing about 19% of that value. Further up, you look at the orange box. This is what we call ineffective prevention. So this was a set of risks that we had for which we had all the information that is required but we lacked intelligent digital track flow to monitor them. And this is where this, the, the claims start happening. Then further up, you see the red bar. That is what we call missing prevention, which means no site visits, no inspections, no information whatsoever except for whatever little that would come with the proposal. So completely missing on information. And this is representing another 24%. So all put together, we are looking at about 48% that is available to us to control. And the balance 52 that you see on the right, the gray one, that's the one what we call bad luck. It's just sheer bad luck that you will have those claims. So this was what we found based on the study we did with our book for about a year. And so we ambition in the long term to really focus on that 48% of our losses for which uh, we wish to deploy this tool that I'm talking to you about today. So these are a few more losses. I, I just spoke about the one in the center. The other two are electrical failure. Same situation, recommendations made, no follow-ups, you have a loss. These are real claims from Generali France. So let's talk a little more about risk care, the, the, the tool that I, I am here to talk about today. Um, the sole mission of risk care 
is prevention. And prevention in a form that's available, having a wide reach to people, it's built on a Salesforce platform, so it's highly scalable. But what's interesting about this, this tool is it has three pillars or three portals or three interfaces. One for insurers, so you could have your underwriters, risk managers, experts on it. The other one for intermediaries, so your agents, your brokers. And the third one for the clients, especially the small business owners or the CEOs of small companies who could actually go up on this tool and self-diagnose and look at the risks that challenge their, their enterprise. It's also um, giving us you the provision to, to score the risks. So every expert that wants to make use of these risk scores based on the analysis can make use of it through this tool. And then it's personalized, so you have individual sites, individual recommendations, individual tracking that will be available per risk. The other one that I really like myself is, is the chat feature. So it's a straight out chat combination of interactions between client and the insurer, client and the agent, agent and the client, agent and the insurer. It's real time. All the information is real time and, 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 and tracked for all future use. And the final part, so we want to call it a full ecosystem, a platform, so which means that we are not just scoring and preventing, we are also including our partners into the ecosystem, which means that outside of the recommendations, we are also giving you local experts and providers who will be on this tool. And let me just take the example of the, of, of the loss that I was explaining earlier. So imagine that fire loss and the recommendation was to put a fire door in a specific place. Now, if this recommendation is through this tool, the client will automatically be able to access local providers who can fix this door for them. So that's the power of this tool, that it's not just recommending, it's giving you access to, to providers and experts who can come and uh, follow up on, on, on the recommendations for you. In case of Generali France, Apav is the trusted partner who works with risk care on this, on this topic. This is just uh, another view of the interfaces that we have. The important thing is all the data and workflows are adapted into one single view, depending on who is the user. I, I have a small video later, so I, I'm not going to make it super boring reading screens for you from the app itself. Uh, but this one I want to explain on the left side. It talks about all the customizable features, so it's, it can be white labeled, you can put your logo there. It has the online chat feature, all of that. But I want to focus on the, on, the, on the right side of the screen. So the second one, the seamless IT integration. I think a lot of out apps out there, a lot of solutions out there, when it comes to deploying them, that's where all the problem starts. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have faced it. So this has been the core for this solution to make sure that that does not become the roadblock. So API first strategy that can integrate with any kind of legacy system that any insurer has. The other part is, is keeping it simple. So you, you, you may have users using this application that do not have the technical know-how as would your risk experts have. Um, so they need to, to be use it simple. I'm being told that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed it up a bit. 
here's a little bit of a glimpse of the, the app per se, how it flows. So here you can see the recommendations being made. And based on this, uh, the user can use the experts through the app and follow up on the recommendations. So you can see the work being done. This is, again, the fire door. And once it's complete, the, the action gets tracked and it's, it's completing. I don't know how to speed up the video, though, so we'll just ready to <laughs> let it run. OK, is the, is the chat feature that I was talking about? Hopefully, this is the last bit, yeah. OK, my last slide. Uh, I spoke about the 4% improvement. I spoke about the long-term ambition of 48 in a, in a more pragma pragmatic way. In the near term, we are looking at 10 points. We are very sure of achieving this. So that's the key message I want to give about this tool. And then uh, all the other aspects, I've touched upon some of them already. Um, the one that I want to speak about and close my, my talk here is the operational gains. So you have gains in terms of efficiencies, audit trails, tracking, all of that. I think the biggest gain from this tool is zero anticipation. With that, I'd like to end my talk. Thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And firstly, congratulations to my fellow pitchers, predictors, and preventers. I think we've all been um, recognized already to get to this point, so thank you to the GIF for that. I think um, videos is always a good medium to demonstrate digital assets, so our two will be starting with a video, and then I'm going to return and have a conversation with myself, so please indulge me for that. Um, if we can go straight to the video, please. Risk data services Swiss Re has Swiss provided Re. solutions to manage the world's largest risks for nearly 160 years. In 2022, Swiss Re's teams around the globe deployed cutting-edge new technologies to help clients get better at managing risks. One such platform is Corporate Solutions Risk Data and Services Platform, a data platform with three innovative solutions that empower corporates to manage property exposure, climate and supply chain risks. RDS is reimagining how risk management works by helping corporates to take control of their risks by giving them access to data and know-how that was previously only available to risk experts. Every corporate receives their private and secure space to manage their risk-relevant data. Our unique risk common data model shapes that data and turns it into a digital twin. The risk digital twin provides a more accurate and precise view of actual exposure. Once the digital twin is created, clients can enrich it with data and insights from Swiss Re and from leading risk experts. So a very quick snapshot, and I think that last line is very important, Swiss Re and other leading experts, and we've heard a lot about that today. Um, so what do I mean by this? We, we really are looking at something which we're trying to create, not by just ourselves, but also in a collaborative approach. And ultimately, it's about addressing major challenges, so I'll touch on two. Number one, We've heard a lot about our world changing, risk accelerating. Well, also, of course, a lot of these risks and everything actually is getting a lot more interconnected. So that's the first point. Second point is when we think about the insurance industry and the brand of the insurance industry, I think by now we all know that the brand of the insurance industry is not going to be improved by us telling people that the brand needs to improve. It's going to come by all of us actually adding real value to the people and the businesses that um, face risk and need it most. So point being, 
we've got to address these, these topics together, and that's really why we've been building risk data services from, from Swiss Re in a way that uh, helps us not only leverage our, our own capabilities, but actually many of you in the room. Any participants um, participating in the insurance or, or, or risk space, we invite them in as well. And that was really the moment in time where we felt we, had, we were doing things different and we were starting to differentiate ourselves. And we had spoken to many different companies around the world. We spoke with risk managers, we spoke with boards, uh, we spoke with C-suite. A lot of the same topic keeps coming back. They're trying to look and get a better understanding of their totality of risk. They want to understand not only the investment risk, the business risk, the climate risk, of course, supply chain risk. We've heard about that today. But they want to understand how it all, what's the relationship between all these risks? And how do they interconnect and how does a business address many different risks on a holistic place? That's fundamentally the key opportunity that um, really we saw early on and uh, that created us to go down this path. So Singapore, actually a wonderful uh, coincidence that we are in Singapore because the incubation of one of those, and that was a very short video, but one of the key early modules was around our sustainability module. The incubation of that happened right here in Singapore. It was a group of very smart individuals um, from Singapore, from Tokyo, from um, Zurich, obviously our head office, where they worked on coming up with a climate risk solution capability, and we launched that in Asia Pacific. Very proud to have been with Swiss Re at this point in time, early on in my Swiss Re career, actually. First engagement, the Singapore government. Many of you will be familiar with GIC. GIC is the investment arm that actually takes care of all the foreign reserves for Singapore. You can imagine the size of that asset portfolio. And what GIC wanted to do is they really wanted to understand not only how does that portfolio and those investment assets, what does the risk landscape look like for them today, but also what is it going to look like in the future. They want to understand how would things like climate change actually impact that portfolio, significant portfolio of reserves that's taking care of all of us that live here in Singapore. And that's where we stepped in. So that's really the incubation. That was the, the birth of what we're talking about here today. I'm probably stretching it a bit. Um, there's been lots of other people that have contributed, but that really was a starting point. And we're here to talk really about predict and prevent. So I wanted to just share with you three themes really on how we're actually transforming around that space in particular. And the first one, the first theme I'll talk about, I, I, term, I term it <clears throat> turning your insides out. So what I mean by that is we actually took the decision that we're going to start sharing our deep models and our data capabilities with customers. But in order to do that, we determined very early on we had to get our shop in order, we had to really get our fundamental platform, data platform, into what we call a single source of truth. That was a huge investment. You heard earlier the reference to Palantir. It took us years. But we figured once you do that, only then you can really build capability, platforms, tools in a consistent way and obviously leverage that for our customers. So that's the first point. You see, obviously, big data has been around for a while, and we can all access big data. You can buy big data. But actually being able to absorb data, build data, effectively analyze data, that's actually not easy. To really capitalize on those investments, you've got to get your operating model in order. So that's really where we started. Once we had done that, and we heard also <laughs> another earlier reference today that companies, large multinationals, they're like a spaghetti bowl. That's true. When it comes to data and systems, many of these companies have grown through acquisitions. They're constantly adding and subtracting. They're building complexity into their business, into their systems and their models. If you can cut through all that and have a single standard data model, it gives you a real key competitive differentiator and advantage. We turned ourselves inside out. Once we did that, we moved on to the second theme, and that was really to think about the power of neutrality. So now we've decided, OK, we're going to give up our tools. What does that mean? You're actually going to be giving and sharing your intellectual property of your organization with customers. That's a big decision for an organization. We took that decision. And for this reason, and you heard earlier today, I think it was uh, Rob Schmick was talking about um, how organizations have such a broad ecosystem of what they access and the touch points that they have to actually help build resilience, help analyze risk, help deal with risk. We figured, and as consequently, a consequence of that, we needed to build this in a very open and neutral space right from the beginning. In other words, what this means is anyone can participate. That was a major change. So IP, but very importantly, done in a secure, safe, private environment. And a very important point for our customers, the customers own the data. So that was the second thing. 
the power of neutrality. And then really what we did with unlocking the predictive and prevention capabilities, this was this concept of the digital twin. And I got asked earlier, what's a digital twin? I think an analogy I can best describe that, think of Google Maps. Many of you must have seen Google Maps, Google Earth. That's not the real Earth. Hopefully I don't need to explain that. That's a digital representation of the planet. You can keep uploading data, keep upgrading it, and you can keep stress testing scenarios against that platform without actually impacting our real world. That's a digital twin. What we did is when we looked at the whole interconnectivity and this challenge around interconnectiveness, we actually got inspired by other industries. We looked out to other industries, and we came across the automotive industry. They delivered and developed a digital twin concept for a vehicle. Think of one car. What, it enabled, what that enabled them to do is actually to invite all participants from within their organization to stress test and develop this digital vehicle. Research and development department, logistics department, design department, and many others, compliance department, especially when you're thinking about the AI components of vehicles. This was our inspiration, the digital twin concept from the automotive industry. So what we've effectively been doing is we've been taking corporate's data, and we've been converting that and turning that into a digital asset, representation of their properties, their assets, and their partners. And that effectively creates this whole single st standard global starting point from where we can start to stress test and build risk models on top of that. That's the fundamentals. So that's the digital twin con concept. Fun fact, Singapore has a digital twin of all of us, by the way. The whole entire Singapore is mapped out onto a digital twin. The point being here in, in, in summary is, we were able to t think differently. We were able to transform ourselves and start to actually stress test our own business and take that organization's strength and use it elsewhere. It was never actually really about data and technology, in my view. It was always about people. Key thing was people rethinking the way that we can operate, also rethinking that the way that our industry can operate. As we heard earlier today, if we can just unlock our own capabilities, and you can combine capabilities and contribute together, that's the power. That's when we will raise the level of everything we do in our industry. That's when we will improve the brand. It was about people. So, in closing, it's Tuesday the 7th of November. Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong has just done an address to the Global Insurance Forum. It's 10.30 a.m. He's walking home. Hopefully he's delivered a wonderful speech tomorrow. And he's thinking, he's imagining about the decade 2040 to 2050. He's thinking, what does Singapore look like then? And he's thinking about the big bets that he takes. Well, our job and what we're trying to do here, we're just trying to improve his odds. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I think it was good, very good presentations, uh, good pitches. We heard, I guess, the consumer focus uh, business focused and a uh, large business focus. So oh, basically it gives you a very clear idea that there is a full spectrum of opportunities in the space. And I, I think we gave you a little bit of a preview and I, I thank uh, the uh, presenters and for the pictures. I think they all did a good job. So with that, I'll pass the floor to John to Thanks. take us through some questions. And I think afterwards the idea is that you guys get to vote. So maybe then you can walk us through how we'll to walk do through it. the polling. But we'll ask a few questions uh, so far. AIA, here we are. What has been your biggest challenge in convincing Indonesia market, which is known for its low insurance penetration? I'd say there are two parts to that. Uh, one is the perception that I mentioned earlier that insurance is just for sick people, or another way of looking at it is to say, I'd rather not actually go for my health check because I'd rather not even know. And that's part of why you saw the core message in the video that we showed that getting that cancer diagnosis, even at age 30, is not something to be afraid of in and of itself. You should be afraid of the one that you don't get diagnosed at 30 and you only find out about much later. So that messaging uh, has been a consistent issue. It predated vitality, but vitality, because the health check is so central, uh, is really that's become our main challenge in a way, but fortunately we're having some success. Uh, the second piece I'd mention is just, and it's probably a common theme here, is going digital. And I mentioned earlier that Vitality exists on an app. We had to introduce so many features for the first time, two-factor authentication, direct integration with WhatsApp, the Apple Watch integration. You can't do this halfway. So we've had the opportunity to 
really push the organization forward. Uh, but I'm convinced this is something that needed to happen anyway, so I'm happy to be the one to do it. That's the right time to do it. Thanks, Abraham. Um, Captain, for risk care, can this tool be used for pricing? Yes, absolutely, it can. Um, but for, for the purpose of what we showed you today, uh, we have decided consciously, generally, France, to keep the prevention aspects of the tool and the pricing assets separate. So which means that we are still focusing on, on, on prevention. Uh, but if some insurer or, or client or, wants to use it for pricing, of course, there's a very suite of uh, risk scores available for you to plug it into your models and use it as a, as a factor. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. And uh, Jonathan, wh what has been the response from the customers to your solution? So it's, it's been a fascinating journey, actually, um, and mainly for those that are, have actually been involved in living and breathing this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that's not me, but I have actually joined um, some of the customer demonstrations when the team's been going through it, some of the onboarding sessions, just to get a bit of a feel for um, how this is going and what we're actually solving on their side. And uh, just give you two anecdote examples. One, is that one was a great aha moment, and another one was an aha learning moment for us. Um, the first very large multinational company that um, we had already onboarded with the um, property and sustainability compass um, solutions and they were looking to, to bring in um, the supply chain component. And very sophisticated supply chain manager within the organization. They, had, they, they have many different component parts of this particular industry that are traveling around the world. They knew where their multiple tiers of um, options were around their supply chain. So they were very advanced. And it was really the point when we got to the ability to scenario test and stress test that the aha moment happened for that customer. Because they had a good view on their parts, but what they didn't know is what would happen if multiple different events happened or at one time or over a period of years. What does that actually do to your supply chain? This could be political risk, and climate risk, many different things. We don't just upload the customer's data, we upload other data sets as well. So for, in this case, for example, we had all the ports and logistic centers around the world. So they would be able to then know if this event happened, if there was a major earthquake or a tsunami or whatever the event may be, or it was just something simple like floods, more frequent. How would that stress test, what would that impact? Could there be an impact on the ports? What does that mean? And suddenly, the aha, aha moment for, for this particular um, head of supply chain was they can now go to sit down with the board and the management team and start to talk about some of the things that were always just blue sky thinking and assumptions before, and really take their um, supply chain to another advanced level. So that, that stress test, that risk, that scenario planning was something they'd never seen in the industry. Um, the aha learning moment for me was uh, a different case um, where you actually see you've got to keep refreshing, you've got to keep learning on both sides. So we had gone through this process looking at, at property risk and what we actually determined and what this came back from the customer is that there have been more advanced developments on flood protection in this particular city that actually would indicate that their risk scoring should be a bit better. Now, we can't always keep up to speed with everything that goes on in every country and every city. So we've always trying to apply and upgrade data, and we're trying to get general data sets as well as build from our own. But a lot of this is just about the journey of going through it with the customer, and then you start to get more and more accurate. So we're not sitting here saying we've, we've got all the answers, not at all. And that's the whole sort of collaborative piece. If we can bring other participants playing with stronger models than ours in certain space, that's the real value. So a very fascinating journey. Thank you very much for that. Well, you would have just got a message on your app. Did everyone get a message on their app? Yes. Okay, in that message, there's an opportunity to uh, make a vote. And where will I see if I moved off the message? Is it, I assume it's in the session. So let me just make sure I go there. No, it's not. For those on the front page, there's what's happening now on the schedule. Share your thoughts. I think take the survey, let's see. Magic, predict and prevent global innovation award voting. And then please select your top choice for the predict and prevent global innovation award. Are people, have people found their way onto that one page? There's an award for getting to the page. <laughs> people found it and all you have to do is to tick press 
One for risk care, or the second one was AIA Vitality, and then Swiss Re Risk Data and Services. Did people find that? Any concerns? Andreas has found it, so that's fantastic, and, and voted. Any particular bias that you might have? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know. <laughs> okay, everyone okay? Well, look, uh, this is one of our favorite sessions, and thank you very much for the presentation today. It was just absolutely fantastic. Love hearing all the stories about the innovation. Thank you very much for all your hard work.